Welcome to For What Sayeth the Scripture. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. My name is Don, and my co-host is George. This podcast will challenge you, and more often than not, confront and offend you. Most of our topics you will not like. In fact, you will probably hate. Nevertheless, we are about telling you the truth whether you like it or not. So, wherever you are listening, have your Bible ready and try and enjoy what saith the Scripture. It's Monday, 27th. I'm here, Don. How are you going? Good yourself. Yeah, pretty good. That's all right. Part two tonight. Yeah. Great. Been looking forward to it. Yeah. It's encouraging. Like, we know of these scriptures and we read them, but when you sort of go through them one after the other, it's like, it's incredible. Incredible stuff. It is, Don. And no other holy books have anything even close to this sort of thing. That's right. It's incredible. And if you did come across it somewhere, they got it straight from the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yep. So why don't we start, and this is probably the most popular one of all, the one that's been rebutted by all the sceptic, atheist crowd. We'll read it first, and it's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now, here it says that the earth was round. Yep. It was round, a circle. You know, at the time, they didn't know the earth was round. They thought it was flat. No, that's true. But what the skeptics will say, oh, but the earth is not a circle, it's a sphere. It that's should right. be sphere and stuff like this, you know. So, well, yeah. you know, you can uh, bloviate as much as you want. It does, a circle is still round. Yeah. What I don't understand is that I wasn't in that time, but if you look at the moon and mm-hmm. you see that the moon is round, why wouldn't they have come to the conclusion that the earth was round? That's true. I mean, they didn't, though. No, they didn't. Why? Don't know. Do you know anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, that's incredible. That was the book of Isaiah, which is, uh, when was Isaiah written, George? It's about six, 700 BC? Yeah, somewhere around there, I think, Don. S- or something like that. Yeah. So it's still two and a half thousand plus years ago. Yeah. The other thing the skeptics will say, and they now turn around and say, oh, they never thought the earth was flat. Quote, some old ancient mathematician, and they say, or some old ancient culture, and would say they always thought the earth was round. So this was no big deal that the Bible put it in there. Yeah, I know what you mean. Going back to what you said earlier, Don, about them saying, well, it's not a circle, it's a sphere. So it's three-dimensional. Well, that's true. But when we look at a three-dimensional moon, which is a sphere, we don't see it in three dimensions. We simply see a circle, don't we? Yeah, sure. When you look up in the sky, the moon looks just like a circle. That's right. When you look at the sun, if you can, look at it. <laughs> I guess early in the morning or late in the evening as it's setting, you could probably stare at it a little bit longer. But again, you don't see a three-dimensional sphere. You see a circle. And the other thing they also say is the Earth is actually not perfectly round. It's a bit broader at the equator due to the gravity. So it's actually like a flattened circle in a sense. There's an actual Mm. term for that. I can't remember the name of it. But anyways, as we say, George, it's just semantics. 
Yeah, of course it is. They're trying to find something wrong, even though it scientifically says it's true, that it's round. Ah, oh, it's not exactly round. <laughs> it's round. It's a circle. It is. It is. The thing is that they say, well, that the Bible doesn't say it was spherical, like a sphere. Why didn't mm. you read the next one, George? Okay, then. In Luke 17, 34, 35, and 36, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Now, Scripture assumes a revolving spherical earth here, Don. Jesus said that at his return, some would be asleep at night, while others would be working at daytime activities in the field. This is a clear indication of a revolving earth, with day and night occurring simultaneously. Now, how would man know that? Well, how would they know that 2,000 years ago? That's right. Jesus knew it. Yep. So for all those uh, scoffers are saying that the Bible doesn't say that the earth is a sphere, well, there you go. Yeah. So it's, it says it's a circle and a sphere. That's true. Half the earth is in darkness and the other half is in the sunlight at any given time. Jesus That's right. knew that. So That's some right. people, when he returns, the blessed hope, some will be sleeping and others will be in the field working. It's incredible. He, they knew that. Yep. Jesus knew that 2,000 years ago. Day and night at the same time. Incredible stuff. So, George, let's t- look at now at a different scripture. Mm-hmm. This one to do with animals. I'll read it mm-hmm. in chapter 6 of Proverbs. Okay. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Now it says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Now, there was no evidence that ants actually harvested grain during those times. Sure. It wasn't discovered, roughly, it was about 1870. A British naturalist showed that Solomon had been right, that ants did harvest their food and gather it into their nest. He wrote this a thousand BC. Yep. <laughs> now, how did he know that? They didn't have ant farm glass where they could see how ants would harvest food and farm and so on. Yep. And he gives this scriptures of wisdom to say, look at the ant, look what it does, how it gathers its food for the winter, for, for whatever, during the summer. How did he know that? Another scientific proof, Don, that... These are God's words. Well, here's another one, Don, about it's all about light and how light can be divided. We part certain things in our life. We part our hair, yeah? Sure. Moses parted the Red Sea. But we didn't know that light can be divided. And Sir Isaac Newton studied light and discovered that white light is made of seven colours, which can be parted and then recombined. And science confirmed this four centuries ago. But God declared this 4,000 years ago. So once again, man is catching up with God. (laughs) Well, so as we see white light, God, we see light. You know, when we were children, we used to have like a prism. Remember, we used to get those prisms and you could hold it on a certain angle and you'd see the rainbow. You'd see the, you know, you'd see the, is it seven colours? Seven colours, yeah, right? that's what our eyes can see. That's what light is. That's right. It's amazing that they're colours, yet they it's clear. Yeah, it is amazing. Or even sometimes you can hold a, a hose. And yeah. if, there's, you know, if it's raining, you can see, again, you can see the colours of the rainbow, which is, right. which is what light is. So why don't you read the scripture? What does it say? Sure. Well, in Job 34, uh, sorry. Job chapter 38, verse 24. By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? So God asked Job a question. God asked Job many questions in the book of Job, but God asked him a question. By what way is the light parted? And Job didn't know the answer to that, but God did. 
because God made light. God is <laughs> light. God is light. And God told Job that light can be parted. And man didn't know that until four centuries ago where Sir Isaac Newton uh, studied it and discovered that white light is made up of seven colours. And what's beyond the boundaries of the light? We've got ultraviolet light. Yeah. Is that right? And then infrared. Yeah. And we can't see that with the naked eye. Yeah. But with our naked eye, what we can see is the seven colours of the rainbow. That's right. Amazing stuff. Sure is. And basically, George, light is photons, particles, and they yep. travel in waves. Yep. And by what way is the light parted? It's incredible. Yeah. Scientifically accurate statement. That's right. Where is it? The Word of God. In one of the oldest known literature to man, the Book of Job. Yeah. Ah, oh, he, he added that in later. Yeah, well, they've got to come up with some excuse, don't they? Yeah, it's been interpreted after the fact they've put it in. Yeah. You know, people believe that, they'll say that. Oh. Because someone, they hear someone say it, oh, they, they added it in after they discovered it. That's anything, ignorant they are. Anything to believe the Word of God. You know, people say, oh, the Bible can be interpreted so many ways. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that being said about any other type of literature? No. Nope. Say, for example, uh, a history book. Mm -hmm. uh, say a World War II history book. And someone's relaying the evidence of you know, the Russian front and the Allied front. Do they turn around and say, oh, look, you can interpret that any which way you like? That doesn't no, actually, it doesn't actually mean that. It means this. We don't know what this guy's telling us about the history of World War II and what the Russians were doing and what the Allies were doing and what the Germans were doing because you can make words mean anything you want. I mean, no one ever says that. Everyone accepts what the author is writing and understands what the author is relaying to us. But when That's it comes right. to the Bible, all of a sudden, words can mean anything you want them to mean. Sentences can mean anything you want them to mean, and you can interpret it all different types of ways. How come it's only the Bible and no other bit of literature? Yeah, it's amazing, Don. But basically, there's no threat to us from past history. So man sees that and just accepts it. But they say to themselves, well, if we believe that this is a scientific fact and it's true, we have to believe that if we don't get saved, we're going to hell. And people don't like to hear that they're going to hell. So they just ignore it and say, oh, this was added in later or this is interpreted this way or that way. Because if they believe that, well, then you have to ask them, okay, why didn't you believe this part about the fact you're going to hell? Yeah, well, um, more to the point what I'm saying is that for some reason, when it comes to the Bible, words don't mean what they mean. Sentences don't mean what they mean. They can mean anything. Because oh, you can interpret the Bible so many different ways. Why can't you interpret other bits of literature so many ways. Why sure. Why are they accepting the meaning of words and sentences in other literature but won't accept the meaning of words and sentences in the Bible? All of a sudden, it means something else yeah. or means whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. I don't understand it. If that's the case, if the Bible can do that, well, that's even more remarkable. They can mean anything. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> this word doesn't mean that. It means this. And this sentence didn't say that. It says that. Mm. You read other books, like if you read a novel, a book, an author writes a novel and he's going to tell you a story of fiction, a murder mystery, whatever. It means you must have to comprehend what he's trying to tell you, hmm. what you're reading. You have to understand what he's saying, that the murderer used gas to kill the person. Mm -hmm. you, must, you have to understand what that means. Yeah. Can you interpret that a different way? No, you Say, can't. Oh, doesn't really mean that it means no no one ever questions it it just accepts what the author wrote why yeah. don't people accept the author god himself when he writes his word why don't they accept what he says all of a sudden the bible means can be interpreted any which way you want oh there's so many interpretations you can interpret whatever you like it doesn't make sense to me yeah well john it all comes back to the book of genesis where the devil put doubt on what god said where he said to eve Yea, hath God said, and he's still doing it. He's still putting it in the minds of man. Did, did God really say that? Did he really mean that? Is, is that what he meant? If God's so loving, will he mean? He won't put me in hell. 
Yeah. Why would a loving God punish me for eternity? Yeah. Why? That's what they'll yeah. say. Well, you're punishing yourself. He, like we said once before in our podcast, he provided a way out. If he didn't provide a way out, sure, you've got something to argue about. Mm. But he provided a way out. That's right. And he provided it in one of the most excruciating deaths known to man. Yeah. And he suffered it himself. Yeah. And think about it, he didn't have to do it. Mm. God himself says, oh, I'll have to go down there, become a man and get crucified. People are lucky I'm not God because I wouldn't have done it. No, that's true. <laughs> I would have said you're just going to all go to hell. Yeah, pretty much. All right, anyway. Sorry, George, let's get back onto it. Uh-huh. Okay, let's see. 3,000 years ago, George, mm-hmm. the Bible described that there were paths in the sea. What do you mean by paths in the sea? I don't know. There's paths, there's footpaths, there's roadways. There's like currents. Right, okay. okay. There's certain areas in the ocean where the water is flowing at, uh, stronger, mm-hmm. like a current called paths. So okay. if you could find that particular current, and if you know where they are, you would be able to, if you, had, if you were on a ship or so on, you'd be able to go sail quicker. Okay. All right. In the 19th century, a bloke called Matthew Maury, he was like one of the fathers of oceanography. Okay. He read Psalm 8, and we'll read it in a second. Mm-hmm. And he, then he researched. So he obviously was a Bible believer. Okay. So he decided to do some research, and he did discover that there were currents that flow specific paths through the seas. Since then, mariners and navigators have been using his data, and they've reduced many days when they traverse the seas. So basically, they just get onto a path in the direction they're going, and I'm assuming that because of the path and the current, they'd use less fuel, they wouldn't need as much sails, the current would just take them to pretty much where they'd want to go. Yeah, it's like a plane in the air travelling downwind. Okay. They're going to be using less fuel if you're travelling downwind. I'm not quite sure if these currents change or they, they're set mm-hmm. and fixed. I don't know. But let's read it in Psalm 8, chapter, uh, Psalm 8 verse 8. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. And there it is. There it is. So, like I said, I don't know. I mean, if people really want to do some research about it, knock yourself out. Uh, Yeah. Like I said, I don't know if they're fixed or they move around, but I think everyone probably knows that there are currents in the oceans. Mm -hmm. And there must be some major ones that ships and boats and mariners can use. And the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. Incredible stuff. And again, thousands of years ago, they knew about that. Now, how would anyone during those times know about that? I mean, I don't know how far they would travel. I don't think until the English started travelling major traverses around the world when they discovered America and Australia. It wasn't until, I don't know, it was probably late 16th, 1700s when they started travelling a bit further during those times. Uh, I don't know how far they were travelling. I don't think they were travelling too far. No, no, they wouldn't have been. Because yeah, they didn't they didn't discover all these other countries that they discovered later. Thousands of years ago, this was written in the Bible. Another scientific proof. Yeah. Something that we've discovered recently is written in the Bible thousands of years ago. And it's, and it's nice to see that there was one particular guy, this guy Matthew Maury, that decided to read the Bible and then discover it. And that's what they say, oh, if you believe in God, there's going to be less science advancement. No, if you read the Bible, there'll be more science advancement. And like a lot of archaeology, especially, mm-hmm. maybe not so much now, but when people believed in the Bible, they used to go to the Bible all the time to, and to, yeah. to try and find things from history. And they would read certain things in the Bible, certain stories, and then they'd go in that area and they'd start digging it up. And sure enough, they'd find the town or they'd find the tomb or whatever else they were trying to find. Yeah. At least it gave them some indication uh, of where they could start digging. Because you know, if you're going to start digging, it's hard work. You don't want to be too far off the mark. No, this is true. Let's look at the next one, George. This is a bit different, but still, it's there. It'll be controversial and people will call us bigots and so on, but nevertheless... Yeah, that's all right. We're used to it. Yeah, we preach what the Bible teaches and what it says. We've, 
We've been called worse than bigots, Don. Yeah, true. <laughs> now, I mean, but it's just common sense that, you know, sexual promiscuity is dangerous to your health. If you start sleeping with a lot of people and having sex with all sorts of people, prostitutes or whatever, I mean, the, the chances are higher that you're going to get some sort of disease. Does a medical practitioner need to tell you that? Does, you know, no, it's like, common sense. It's common sense. If you start sleeping around, if you start going to these areas where there's a lot of drugs and so on, like the red light districts, say, in Sydney, the Red Cross, even though the Red Cross has been cleaned up a lot now, but during our times, it was filthy, George. You, you mean the red light district, or not the Red Cross? <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the red, red, the red light district. Uh, yeah, I mean, remember when I was young and you know we went to the King's Cross? It was a filthy place. There was drunks lying in the street, homeless people, and it was just the streets were just dirty, and you could see junkies sort of looked like they OD'd. Yeah. yeah, just wandering around, crossing the street in a gaze. Yeah, the prostitutes, the women that would come up to you, they just looked, oof, they were, they were, geez, they were ugly. That's and, disgusting. And yeah. you'd see they were just junkies. Yep. And and some were sort of in a fetal position in, in the front of a building. It was just a shocking place. Yeah. Now, if you think you're going to go to those places and have sex and then think you're not increasing the chances of picking up some sort of disease, well... You're kidding yourself. Yeah, you, you, you need you need help. You need therapy. Yeah. You, need, yeah. you, need, you need something. <laughs> but uh, let's read what the Bible says. It warns okay. us yep. that he he who commits sexual immorality will will sin against his own body, and that yep. those especially like if you get even to the extremes of sexual immorality, like homosexuality, what is one of the greatest diseases that homosexuals are scared of? AIDS. Oh, that came from monkeys from Africa. Yeah, sure. So, first of all, we evolved from monkeys and now AIDS also comes from monkeys. I mean, they just blame everything on monkeys from Africa. That's true. Poor little fellas. Yeah. Yeah. They're cute buggers, man. Leave them alone. Yeah. Let's read a couple of scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So now Paul is telling you that you're going to reap these sort of actions that you do in your body. How does your body suffer? Diseases. Diseases. How else is it going to be? Yeah. Uh, Another one, Romans chapter 1, verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lusts, one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Yeah. So basically, they get what you deserve. Yes, yes. If you do these sort of things, God's giving you a warning. He's saying, look, if you cross this line, if put a, puts a line in the sand, so you can have sex between a man and a woman when you're married as much as you want. Knock yourself out. Yeah. But once you cross that line, you're on your own, and this is the sort of things that can happen to you. Yeah. And there's an example of a New Testament scripture in Romans where, I don't know if you heard that the latest homosexual pushes, or they say that the New Testament doesn't talk against homosexuality. Well, <laughs> they obviously don't read this scripture. Yeah, that's right. Maybe in that bit of trash you call a Bible doesn't say it, but the Word of God says it. Yeah, well, the modern churches as well, the modern so-called Christian churches, some yeah. of these uniting churches that accept homosexuals and so on, obviously yeah. that, you know, because they say, oh, the New Testament doesn't talk bad about it. It's only in the Old Testament. Well, like I said, I don't know which Bible they're reading. And obviously, they're not reading the King James. I suppose one day, George, eventually, and it's only a matter of time, they'll eventually get rid of the King James Bible. Yeah. No. Yeah. Look. Well, God talks about a famine of his word. Yep, yep. In the Old Testament, he says, there'll be a famine of my word. And I think, like when when I first started getting involved in God and so on, like I said, I remember going to the Christian bookshops, the display of the, the Bibles, the largest amount was the King James Bible. Yep. It was all different types of King James Bibles, different font, large print, small print, Jesus in the red, and so on. Uh, you could different colored covers and so on. 
and then they'd have a few of the other modern versions. And now it's the other way around. It's hard to find a King James Bible in a Christian bookshop. Well, this is true, Don. My wife and I went to get a couple of Bibles for um, my nieces probably about a year and a half ago. The amount of new versions there was just ridiculous. And I would say that the King James section was the smallest section. Used to be the biggest, now it's the smallest. It's, it's the smallest, definitely. And there's going to come a time where it's, like I said, they don't do it straight away. They don't just ban it. No, uh, no, it's but, a gradual thing. Exactly. They'll turn around and say, look, you, you eventually they'll say, you, you can buy a King James Bible, but you can't display it. It has to be under the counter. You can only yeah. sell it if people ask for it. Yeah. And then they'll turn around and say, look, if, you know, you can't preach the King James Bible. Preachers are not allowed to preach it from the pulpit, but you can read it at home. You can't, and eventually they'll get rid of it completely. So I said, people don't, that's how they always do everything. I mean, look at smoking, for example. Mm -hmm. Remember, initially in a restaurant, they had to have partitions. Half a restaurant could smoke, other half couldn't. Or if you went to a nightclub, that section of the nightclub could smoke and that section can't. And then they turn around and say, now, can't smoke inside, you can only smoke outside. And now you can't even smoke outside. Certain areas soon, you won't be able to smoke in public at all, and you'll only be able to smoke at home until eventually they just ban it completely. Yeah. So it's always a gradual process, and it's the same thing. The Bible will be the same. They're slowly but surely getting rid of it, and the day will come, like like you said, George. From memory, it's in Amos 8.11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So God himself is going to send that famine from hearing his words. Basically, from what that, from what I read into that, Don, it's pretty straightforward. God's going to take his word away. I think people are just not interested in hearing it. And what would you do, Don, if you were telling someone something and they go, oh, I don't care, I'm not interested. Eventually, so I'm not going to tell you anymore, aren't you? Yep. So why wouldn't God be any different? People don't want to hear it. God will say, right, you don't want it? That's it. I'm taking it away. Especially when God went through so much trouble and so many people died. Yeah. So much blood was shed yeah. for that beautiful book, the King James Bible. The way he gave, has given us his word in the last days, this majestic, beautiful language, mm-hmm. the Elizabethan English. Mm-hmm. And it's like I said, the poetry of it all. And people hate it. Yeah, they <laughs> they hate it with a passion. That's the thing. They don't even just not like it. They hate it. Yeah. They call it the archaic English. No one understands it. And as you can see, even tonight, all the scriptures we've read, what's hard to understand? Yeah. Like yeah. in the one we read in Psalm 8, 8, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. Mm, the fish of the sea. What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, I've got no idea. Fish. What, what? I've never heard such words. Fish of the sea. I mean, you know what that means, George? Yeah, no. I'm, I'm still trying to work out birds of the air. And whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. The paths of the seas. Whatsoever. What does that mean? Hmm. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. I've got no idea what that means. I mean, that's just like, what is this? What language are they speaking? Yeah, every sin that a man doeth. What the? Well, I mean, okay, enough you know, jesting here. I mean, it's look how simple it is. What's no, difficult? No. What's archaic about it? Yeah, I know you're right, Don. But and I said he went through all this trouble to give us his word in a beautiful form, and then they hate it. Yeah, like you say, God says, okay, one day you're not going to have it at all. Yeah, and if that's going to be done the way we just said through. The world going to eventually going to get rid of it, uh, and he's allowing them to do it. Because remember, God promises His word for all generations. Yeah. So, when He does remove His word from the earth, uh, isn't that another generation? That's right. So why aren't they having it? I guess we'll be gone then. Yeah, I think it comes to the time when during the tribulation, and that becomes a different age. And yeah. the Bible covers that all sorts of yeah. things. Even the Holy Spirit is gone, isn't it? Yeah. And then the Christians are gone, the Holy Spirit's gone. It's basically anarchy. Yeah. And it's that's just, true. I think it's, there's going to be a point where, like I said, the Antichrist, the devil, he's in comp- 
complete control. And it's just, there you go, you want to, this is what you've wanted. You've wanted a world without God, without his word, without the Holy Spirit, without any morality. Here you go, this is what it's going to be like and this is what you're going to get. And people will see what the fruits of that sort of uh, belief and behavior will be. Yeah. Well, Don, this is the beginning of the falling away, as it tells you in Thessalonians, just before the rapture. Basically, all I've heard since I've been going to King James-only churches is this isn't right, this should be changed, this word doesn't belong here. One guy at a King James-only church, he used to, his sermons were sensational, Don. He used to read the King James so perfectly. And he actually slammed the King James shut in front of me once. He goes, this is archaic and we shouldn't even be using it. It's you know, the, the unsaved world, they don't care. To them, the King James is the same as an NIV. If it says Bible, they don't know if it's a King James, NIV, message, or whatever. But it's a King James mob which are getting rid of it. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. They hate it more than anyone. They're the ones changing the word. They're the ones that publicly, they're saying, this is the word of God, but privately, uh, this is full of mistakes, this is that, this is that, this shouldn't be here, this word really means this from the Greek. They're the ones that are getting rid of it. Well, how do, say, for example, the mafia in America, mm-hmm. how will they... They are relatives of yours? <laughs> uh, I've got a few relatives that, are, yeah. that were, you know, like cause on Austria. But anyway... Yeah. Uh, that's why I, I've always shown you respect. You know that, Don. Don't ask me about my business, George. <laughs> don't ask about the family, okay? Forget okay. it. Forget about it. Now, what happened to them? How did the whole organization collapse they infiltrated it with a lot of undercover agents they get on the inside and expose them they're pretending to be mafia they're pretending Mm. to be La Cosa Nostra they're pretending to be wise guys and you know they're recording stuff or whatever that's right so many movies have been made about that very subject yeah and that's even throughout history a lot of wars and so on they they want to get double agents in there Mm. so Donnie Brasco, for example. Right. So now the devil said to himself, how am I going to destroy this King James Bible? I'm going to make a whole heap of King James only us, yeah. right? Bring them on the inside and destroy it from the inside out because they're the worst. Yeah. They're doing more damage than good because they, they're the ones promoting the King James Bible. Then when you yeah. listen to them, all they do is put doubt on it and, and uplift the modern versions. That's it. <laughs> it's the same thing. It. So why wouldn't the devil also use that tactic? That's right. True. Absolutely right, Don. I can't argue with you there. We never let them sleep. No. <laughs> no. We got to we got to hit them where it hurts every time we talk about the word of God. George, you were raised uh, an Orthodox, myself a Catholic, and then we went to the Pentecostal Church and so on. But no one angers me more than those King James Elias. Yeah, I know what you mean, Don. No, they... I was I was very disappointed, Don, when we you know got out of, we got out of the Pentecostal movement. And we finally found what we thought was King James only people. And it just became more and more disappointing to realize there was no one out there. No. Like I said, like I said they're the worst because they're the ones that, that say that they're King James only. We stand up for it and so on, promote it, preach it, believe it. And then when you find out that they're the worst, they hate it. That's right. All they do is tell you how good modern versions are and that modern versions have the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> And that the King James Bible has got errors in it, and it's just a reliable translation and so on. No. So how is that uh, uplifting God's word? No, They're not. uplifting what they say are books of the devil. <laughs> yep. We don't want to get there again. We don't get started into that again. Because no. it's just, uh, like I said, it's, sometimes you just got to go to a wall and hit your head against it. And it makes, yeah, that I makes know. more sense. Yeah, it does. It's crazy. I think it hurts less. What, hitting your head against the wall? Yeah. <laughs> well, especially our heads, George, so they're hollow. Yeah, that's what, that's what our wives say anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, well, I feel better now that we had a go at those King James occasionally crowd. Yeah, I know. I think we're in the zone, Donnie, do you? Yeah, we've got to give it to them. I said, yeah. you guys, we never let you sleep. You're going to cop it all the time. Yeah, that's true. You're going to always be mentioned. Yeah. Every, as often as possible. Because you guys are the worst. You guys yeah. think you're the best, yet you're the worst. That's right. Hmm? And we know you're listening. 
because you hate us. You love to hate us. <laughs> All right, George, we're going to get back on track here. Oh, okay, if we have to. I feel better. We've given those uh, independent, fundamental Baptist churches a bit of a lambasting. Let's get back on track. Do we have to? Yeah, yeah, we have to. All right. How about, Don, we do a podcast one night where we just hammer them just for the fun of it? Well, we sort of did in the Twilight Zone. Yeah, I know, but, but I think we should do a, another one where we just, just let them have it for no reason at all, just muck around. and. That would be fantastic. Yeah, it yeah. sounds good. Put all, everything we can think of. Yeah. Because they are, they are pathetic. Oh, they make me sick. If you go to their websites, yeah. here we go again. <laughs> well, we got going now. But you go to their websites, you look at you know, these independent fundamental Baptist churches. They look like Amish people. Yeah, so, I know. You know what I mean? Like if you look at it, I've, I've got photo galleries and stuff. They might have a conference and so on. Especially yeah. the women. They all look like, literally they look like the Hamish people. Yeah, Something I know. Something a little house of the prairie. Yeah. <laughs> And then you you go to the list of their sermons and you read what, read the titles and it's just like it's like one big yawn. Oh, I know what you mean. There's just no meat. Nah, it's just it's basically what are you doing for God and look what I'm doing. It's all about guilt trips, Don. Well, I'm a full time minister and you're not. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, so you're not doing anything because but look at me, I'm a full time minister, I'm a full time yeah. missionary, and yeah. obviously you're not. That means you're not yeah. you're not serving God at all. Yeah, well, the Bible talks about every man has his own gifts and you're only a full-time minister because there are people out there working and paying your income. Mm. But you keep hassling that they're never at church because they're working. <laughs> <laughs> you want to yell, you want to scream. Uh, and as I said, I feel sorry for the members of this church. As I said, the only ones that remain are the simple type. Yeah, and they, that's why they get as we've you know, I'm not going to repeat what we said in the Twilight Zone, but that's why they get so easily manipulated by these guys. Yeah, they do. Keep them in the churches and live off their hard-earned sweat. Yeah, and just make them feel guilty all the time and keep them in the dark. Yeah, that's all they do. I mean, Paul, the apostle Paul, worked with his own hands to support himself, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he uh, he heard that the Corinthian churches, I think it was the Corinthian church were, you know, he heard moanings and uh, groanings that why are we giving Paul money and so on. And it got back to Paul and he basically said, look, I don't want nothing from you. And when, yeah. when he went there, he would work. He was so intense or something. Yeah. He didn't want any money from them. Yeah. That's the example he gave. Yeah. And what he did get, he gave to the poor churches. Mm. They said that they shouldn't expect it. I mean, if, you know, if we're a member of a church, George, I, I don't want my pastor. I want to look after my pastor because sure. we want to do it. That's right. Not because you expect it. That's right. Uh, the members of the church, uh, if they've got a pastor that's noble, loves the word of God, teaches his flock, we want you to study and pray and let God teach you whatever he can so you can then relay it to us. Yeah. And we'll, don't worry. You stay home, pray study the Bible, do what you have to do, uh, we'll go out and work and we'll pay for everything that you need yeah. and we're going to look after you really well. Yeah. Something that the members would love to do. But these guys, they're con men. Yeah. You know, they just do it because they expect it because they think they're better than you. Yeah. Because they're full-time ministers and they've studied the Greek and they can correct the Bible. Yeah. And I'm sure you'll agree with me on this point, Don. I mean, we went to a couple of churches together and we went to other churches separately but really there was i never got any meat and i'm sure you never got it there either all we got was the same sermon rehashed week after week basically you know what are you doing for god and the seven s's of joy and how to have joy and how to this out of that basically they were talking to a bunch of people that needed therapy you know they were constantly depressed and the pastor had to say, well, this is how you have joy. This is how. There was no meat. Nah, it was you know milk. I mean? I mean, what do they do? They say, oh, I gave this sermon two weeks ago. I know. I'll change the heading and change a few words and give the same one. So what do they do? What are they being paid for? Like they would read a little you know, part of the Bible. I don't know. Some guy would move a, a set of stones from one place to another. Mm. And they would make a whole sermon out of that about yeah. how you shouldn't move your foundation 
uh, your foundation is in God's word and your foundation is in God and you've moved your stones from this place to that place and now those stones are falling down and it's like, oh, please. I was just like, I wanted to vomit. I was just like so sick of the same rubbish. Oh. And there was no, like they're trying to make, like you said, they're trying to make it like real meaty and like really profound. And oh. it was just kindergarten stuff. Yeah, I don't know about you, Don, but I never left a church service edified. I left feeling guilty. I left miserable. I left depressed. And I just kept thinking, how can I? Church shouldn't be a place. It should be a place where you look forward to going to think, I'm going to learn something today. You know, last sermon, I learned so much about Jesus Christ, about the Word of God, about this, about that, about salvation. Uh, I learned so many things, but I left there thinking, do I have to come back here again next week and listen to the same nonsense? And they start crying. <laughs> oh, they're the crying. Sins. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> the weeping. It's one big pretentious act. Oh. The theatrics, the whole, it's one big show that, I don't know, people must get off on it. And then everyone at the end of the service would shake the pastor's hand and, oh, bah, great uh, sermon. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, don't thank me. Thank God he gave me that message. And, you know, especially that, oh, I was praying last night and God gave me this message for you people today. Uh, so they, you, they should join the Pentecostal church. Yeah. They're looking for people like you. Yeah. God talks to you. <laughs> yeah. This thing about God talking to you. Uh, I mean, God says this to you. God, God has already told you everything in his word. That's it. <laughs> you don't have to sit there and pray and so you see if you can hear God's voice. You know, God, what's your will for me? Just read his yeah. word. Yeah. It gives Simple. you his will. Simple. It's all there. Yeah. They don't want to read it. Because, see, the thing is they don't believe that it is his word. No. See, that's no, why no. they don't honor it. They don't respect it. Yeah. Because if you don't believe that's his word, pure, perfect, inspired, infallible, inerrant, Unless you believe that, why would you accept what it says? Yeah, why right. would you obey or try and obey what it says? Yeah. Why would you go there to see God's will when you don't believe it's his word? But if you believe it's his word, you'll understand, well, his will's there for you. Oh, George. Oh. Come on, let's get going. Okay. Don, have you ever been to an observatory? I have to honestly say, George, I think actually when I was at school, I'm pretty sure we did. But I yeah. can't remember. I really can't, but I'd, I'd say it had to be part of our school excursions. I mean, I'm talking about when I was in primary school or something. But uh, yeah. I can't remember. I've, no, I haven't. I, look, let me put it this way. Because I can't remember, I'm going to say no. Okay. My missus dragged me to one a few years ago. Because she's into, yeah, you know, she loves looking through telescopes and this and that. She is a stargazer, is she? Yeah, yeah, she's a bit of a stargazer. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's fine. I mean, look, I find astronomy fascinating, George. I love it. I love watching astronomy documentaries. I find it fascinating. I love it. Yeah. I mean, look, I can take it or leave it. But uh, anyway, we had nothing else to do one night. And uh, a local, when I say local, it's probably about 30 kilometers away. They have to be far enough out of the city because you have to get away from the city lights. Yep, sure. Anyway, we went out to this observatory and they had about probably had about 10 telescopes of different sizes that you could go and have a look. And they had one pointing at this particular cluster of stars or one pointing at this planet and so on and so forth. And I actually enjoyed myself that night. And I remember looking through a telescope, Don. I mean, if I look up at the sky with my naked eye, you can see, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of stars all over the place. And I remember if I go out to the country... A mutual friend of ours has got a farm, and if we go out there, we could see them a lot clearer and a lot more of them. But, Don, what was amazing was I looked through this one telescope at just one spot in the sky, one little spot. I think, Don, that if I said that I could see tens of thousands of stars in that one spot, I wouldn't be exaggerating. And it blew my mind. I thought to myself, that's just in one spot. So this was, at, this was at night time, was it? Yeah, yeah. So this that was, was like a 
it's something they hold for people to do? Well, this particular night was an open night. They were trying to get people involved and, I don't know, get people to join their club or get people involved in astronomy and that sort of thing. So you can donate, obviously. Yeah, of course, there was a donation, <laughs> donation at the door. Of know. course, you have to. It always comes back to the do re me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but nevertheless, it was an interesting night. I saw some pretty colourful stuff, pretty amazing stuff, stuff that I could never see with the naked eye. But the point I'm trying to make here, Don, is that it wasn't until the 17th century that Galileo glimpsed the immensity of our, our universe with his telescope back in the old days before Galileo they thought that there's probably not more than 5,000 stars that were visible to the human eye. God stated that the stars of heaven were innumerable. And today astronomers estimate that there are 10,000 billion trillion stars. That's even hard to say. One followed by 25 zeros. I can't comprehend that, let alone 25,000. Yeah, I mean, one but, followed by 25 zeros is it's huge. Yeah. I mean, it's immense. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. that's, they're numbers and figures that, you know, forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. But as the Bible states, scientists to this day admit that this number may be woefully inadequate. So let's have a look at what the Word of God says, Don. All righty. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. God says that the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea. I mean, can you imagine counting how many grains of sand are in the sea? It's impossible. Yep. And, yet, and yet God knows the number. Sure. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their hosts by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. God calls them all by names. So he's got a name for every single star. Every single one of them, right? Man says there's 10,000 billion trillion stars, probably more, and God knows them all by name. Well, he created them. He created them. Psalm 147, verse 4. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. So God can tell you the number of stars in their universe, and he can tell you their names. Incredible. And, and man didn't know this. Until Galileo said there's there's a lot more than 5,000 stars up there, guys. And there's hundreds of trillions. <laughs> and this is like 3,000 years ago it was written. Yep. Ain't you? Because God knows. So God created the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's right. So God knew. Yeah. And he told these prophets to write it down. That's right. And they did. That's right. you got to remember, too, during these times, there was a lot of different worldviews, and they're all sort of, you know, with pagan gods and stuff, a lot of superstitious and a lot of, a lot of rubbish. Yet these guys were not influenced by any of that. No. They still wrote it scientifically accurate. Yeah. It's incredible. It is, Don. And you know how the uh, atheists scoff at some of these scriptures? They'll say, oh, look, but uh, it says that the sand can't be numbered. But if, you know, you could actually count them all. Yeah, right. Yeah, Good go luck. ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's... Yeah, I, I won't hold my breath. Technically, you could actually count them if we wanted to. No, mm. you couldn't. No. You couldn't. No. There's no way you could. No. How are you gonna, How are you going to get to the bottom of the ocean and count that? That's right. No, but technically, if you went down there, you, know, you can keep carrying on. You can't. Yeah. And really, would there be anything that could actually count them all? No. You, I mean, you wouldn't, even if they had a machine that could count all the grains of sand, right, and you had to sift it through somehow, mm -hmm. It, I mean, what? how long would it take? It would take more than your lifetime, that's for sure. Yeah, that's true. So you wouldn't know anyway. No. So it can't be done, mm. even though they think it can be done, because obviously they want to find fault in these scriptures, see. So. Mm -hmm. They have to somehow say, oh, it's not really accurate, it's not quite true. Yeah. But it is true. 
And again, it, the Bible does also speak in metaphors. Hmm. Like we've said before, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. You're not going to hmm. eat a horse, though. It's saying that the stars can't be numbered like the grains of sand can't be numbered. It's, it's a metaphor. That's it means right. there's heaps of them. Yeah. One followed by 25 zeros. Yeah. <laughs> that many. I mean, that's what they know now, George. But the further and further they go, remember when the Hubble telescope went out there, mm-hmm. when they sent that up to find the answers of life? Well, you know what they actually found? Nothing. More questions. <laughs> Uh, Not answers. <laughs> well, they just couldn't believe what they found. This is when they started discovering all these galaxies and millions and billions of galaxies. And all yeah. those galaxies have got millions and trillions and billions of stars in them and so on. Yeah. It freaked them out. Because yeah. they got above the Earth's atmosphere and they started pointing the Hubble telescope you know, around and just it freaked them out what they were looking at. Mm. Uh, they didn't find any answers. They found questions. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> more and more questions, and uh, yeah. oh, that's that's what science is all about, you know, discovery. You're not discovering much, you're just finding more and more questions the further out you go, because it's blowing their mind. And yeah. then, of course, now they turn around and say, I think it was a Michio Kuku that said, <laughs> uh, I keep saying that, sorry, Kaku, <laughs> <laughs> because because he is a Kuku, uh, yeah. but he said it's arrogance to think that we're the only ones on this uh, big, you know, in the, in the universe, that we're the only life form. It's arrogance to say that. There must be other life out there. Look at all the stars and suns and galaxies. They've got to be other life out there. Well, if no. you believe in evolution, evolved from a rock, well, yeah, you would believe that rubbish. That's right. <laughs> because if it's happened here, well, yeah, it might have happened somewhere else as well. The impossible happened here. Well, then it might have happened twice. The impossible happened twice somewhere. Yeah. Which, a bit of an oxymoron, because impossibles don't happen. No, that's true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that gives them, somehow they sound clever if they say that oh, there must be life out there, because look look how many people. Yeah. I'm mean, sorry, look how many stars and planets and galaxies. So they're allowed to say that, right? We're not allowed to say, look at the complexity of creation look at the complexity of life forms there must be a god there must be a designer there must so we're not allowed to say that no right but they're allowed to say that they're allowed to say that oh look at all the galaxies and stars and and there's so many trillions and billions there must be life out there well it is why are you allowed to say that and we're not yeah because they make the rules yeah so they're allowed to say it because when they're holding the ball they make the rules that's right. When you hold the, the when you get the ball, the rules change. That's right. So. By the way, Don, is that SETI still going now? That search for extraterrestrial yeah. intelligence? Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, still going. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, he's, he's he always seems to be on the back foot. Uh, Seth Shostak, the guy yeah. that uh, runs the place. I don't think he gets money from the government anymore. Maybe he does. Maybe he just gets a little bit. But it's basically uh, funded by private people. But look, don't worry. He's got plenty of followers that are, yeah. uh, you know, support the whole this whole agenda to try and find life out there because they know it will be the greatest discovery ever if they find found life form out there. Yeah. So you had a still you had an old mate, Don, didn't you? That was involved with that. Yeah, my ex brother in law. What you do, because there's so much information that they download and mm. it has to be filtered through a particular program, to, you know, they're trying to find a radio signal. Basically, that's mm. what they're trying to find. Uh, they, they assume that if there's an intelligent life form out there that they know how to use radio waves mm. or you know, some sort of uh, binary code or whatever. Uh, mm. And... Basically, you have to, during the program, you, your computer will cipher through it all and see if it can make sense of something and they might find some message. And if your computer is the one that finds a message, well, it's a big thing for you too. And yeah. there's heaps of people doing that. It's taken me a while to answer your question. Yes, it's still going. No. You know, they actually, I think they've increased it. I think they've actually put more of these satellite dishes. I think one of the, uh, I think one of the Microsoft guys did it help them out was it might have been apple or microsoft anyway one one of the rich tycoons of the world uh, right. has also invested some money into it and they're trying to get you know they're, they're sort of learning as they go this is every time i hear seth shostak give an interview it's like um we haven't found anything yet 
but because he gives a whole heap of reasons, a whole heap of excuses, because it's a learning process and they're getting better at it and so on. But but no, they haven't found anything. Yeah. And they never will, I, of course. No, of course not. I had a, I've got a neighbour of mine, and um, we're talking about creation, evolution, and he doesn't believe in either, really. He says that we were populated by aliens, and they brought us here. It's, that's called panspermia. Yeah, so I said to him, where did they come from? And he went, he just looked at me and went, oh, I never thought of that. All they're doing is moving the goalposts a little bit. If we came from another planet, if we were, like we said, panspermia, we were spermed by some alien race. Mm. Well, where'd they come from? And then, of course, they turn around, oh, well, where'd God come from? He was always yeah. there. How do you that's know? Right. It's faith. Yeah, yeah well, it. we admit it. It's a faith, mate. That's right. We're not saying it's a scientific fact that we can prove through scientific methods. No. It's a step of faith. That's 100%. It. We, at least we admit that, but you won't admit that you believe that we came from a rock. You won't believe that that's faith. You, you mm. still call that science. That's yeah. the difference between us. That's right. And it's a blind faith and a stupid faith. Oh, well, we've had our little dig at um, King James Onlyus and Alien Hunters. Let's get back to uh, basically the subject of this podcast. Well, sure. There's a few more scriptures on the same theme about the stars and the and the sand. Because mm-hmm. the, the Bible compares the number of stars, like we said, with the number of grains of sand. Sure. All right. Now, amazingly, the estimates of the number of grains of sand is also comparable to the estimated number of stars in the universe, wow. which is basically innumerable. Yeah. See what the scriptures say. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So it compares the stars of the heavens with the sands of the sea. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Mm. They've looked at grains of sand and said, oh, who's only ever going to be able to count these? And then also said, look, you can't even count the stars. How did they know that? Because yeah. if they looked in the sky during their time, and if they had the patience and time, they could have counted all the stars in the sky. Mm. They didn't That's know true. that there was galaxies further on and like the Hubble, what the Hubble telescope discovered. So incredible. Again, another scientifically accurate statement in the Bible, written thousands yeah. of years ago. It's amazing. Yeah. Don, maybe you know, I don't know. You're up with this more than I am. But does the world believe that the universe is infinite? They don't know. They think it is, and then they think it isn't. They're not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, they say they do all these mathematical equations, and that's you know, mass answers all the questions for them. I've heard both arguments. Yeah. And so depending who you listen to, again, they just speculate, George. They just want to sound clever so they can write books and give lectures and write papers yeah. to try and get some you know, Nobel Prize. That's all they're doing. I mean, it's a fascinating subject. Got so much material as well. Because, you know, especially a theoretical physicist, I mean, they can say anything they want. Mm. It doesn't matter what they say. As long as you've got a good imagination, you could become a theoretical physicist and sound clever and smart, write papers, and might even get your own TV show. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask that, Dawn, is that according to these verses, it says that the number of stars is comparable to the number of grains of sand of the Earth. True? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, we know that the number of grains of sand on the Earth is not infinite, is it? No. Because how, whatever that number is, one with a million zeros after it, it's got to end somewhere. Sure. True. All right. Same with the stars, which means that if the scientists of today would think the universe is infinite, if they looked at these scriptures, they would realize that they're not infinite, just innumerable. Innumerable doesn't mean infinite or eternal. It just means you can't count them. There's that many. Sure. Okay, so what are you saying that if you could travel and 
you didn't worry about time and space or whatever. Yeah, you could travel to the end of it. Well, what's on the other side? God. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, I don't know. When you hit the wall. I don't know. Though. When you, I don't know what's on the other side. When you hit that wall, you think, well, <laughs> if you knock on it, will someone answer on the other side? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it blows your mind, doesn't it? You know, oh, like, yes. Some things are just beyond our understanding. You're right. There's got to be, I agree with you, that if God created everything, there must be some uh, ending somewhere. I don't know. Mm. I mean, what is what is space anyway? <laughs> like, what is it? Who knows? You know? And like we've said before, why are we even here? Why is there even a God? Why is there anything? Yeah. It's mind-boggling. It is. It certainly is. Well, speaking about mind-boggling stuff, <laughs> this is a beauty. Now, we learned when we were at school, George, about precipitation. Yep. Basically, how clouds form, mm -hmm. the sun heats and evaporates the you know, water on the earth, then it mm -hmm. forms clouds. Yep. And then when the clouds get to a certain density, they start to drop the water that they've built up and we get rain. That's right. Back to earth and so on. Yep. Now, when was that discovered? What, rain? Well, the whole hydrological cycle. It was only discovered, I suppose, in the last few centuries. Really, did we know about precipitation and evaporation and clouds forming, basically the, a cycle of the water going up to the sky, back to earth, down the rivers, mm -hmm. down the mountains, back to the ocean and so on. That's right. Now, 4,000 years ago, the Bible talks about this. Wow. <laughs> like the ancient people, they would have observed rivers flowing into the ocean. They couldn't imagine that the sea levels would rise. They would have observed rainfall and all sorts of uh, other theories they would have probably come up with. Mm -hmm. But would they have understood the hydrological cycle? Well, if they had the word of God, they would have. I mean, it consists of evaporation, mm -hmm. atmospheric transportation. Mm -hmm. Distillation and precipitation, or the Asians. Or the Asian. I mean, you're using, you're using a lot of big words tonight, Don. I feel, I sound, I feel like a, uh, a scholar. Hey, next time we do one of these, I think I have a thesaurus sitting next to I me. I think I might start. I might. I feel like I should correct some scriptures. <laughs> you know, I'm starting to feel that, George. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm clever. Hey, have you studied Greek? Doesn't matter. I'll, I'll get out a lexicon yeah. and see what it really says. See what the words really mean. Because hmm. I'm feeling smart. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back. Let's go to some, some scriptures. Uh -huh. Ecclesiastics chapter 1, verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come... Thither they return again. Wow. Incredible. This is Solomon, 1000 yep. BC. Yep. He said it. How would he know? Well, he was the wisest man that lived on earth. Now, where did that wisdom come from? God gave it to him. That's it. How did he know that? Yeah. Incredible. It is incredible. In just that simple verse, he explained evaporation atmospheric transportation, distillation, and precipitation. Yep. So All the oceans. The, the King James Bible is hard to understand, George. Mm. But evaporation, atmospheric transportation, distillation, and precipitation, that's easy. Yeah. Modern English. Like, like I said, I need a dictionary. That's easy to say and easy yeah. to understand. Mm. But I think all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. I think that's easier to understand, George. Yeah, I think so too. I have to agree with that. From where, from, from where <laughs> they went, they came from, they return. So when the sun evaporates the water, it'll return it back to the... But the King James archaic English, that's hard to understand. Mm. Maybe it doesn't really mean that. Maybe it's it's you can interpret it differently. So it really means something else. Mm, it must. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapours to ascend from the ends of the earth. 
He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Incredible. Talks about even says the vapors ascend into, into the sky, make clouds. Yeah. The lightning, storms, yeah. and then yeah. the rain. Yeah. I mean, how did he know that? How did Jeremiah know that? Truly is There amazing. is a multitude of waters in the heavens. They didn't know clouds contained it, held water. Hmm. They would have seen them, and then when there's clouds around, it would have rained. But they didn't know any of this sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Amos yeah. chapter 9, verse 6. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out. Out upon the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Where do the waters come from that are in the sky, George? From the sea. Wow. Amazing. Evaporation. Atmospheric transportation. Distillation. And what's the last one, George? Precipitation. <laughs> <laughs> but did you notice, Don, in Amos 9, 6, the first one, it is he that buildeth his stories in heaven. Have you seen clouds that look like some clouds are lower than others? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like three-dimensional yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, and they've got layers. You see one level and there's a level higher than that. There's the stories. Wow, yeah. Well spotted, George, yep, definitely. Layer upon layer. So God calls the waters up. It says, he that calleth for the waters of the sea. So he says to them, okay, he sends the sun out. They come steam they go up into the atmosphere form clouds he calls them up yep so god does that for a reason because the land needs water for the uh for the crops we need water to refresh us and he says okay we'll bring up some water from the sea we'll take it over there and dump it on the ground so we can grow food i mean it's an incredible cycle it is and it's cleansing as well it is like basically when it rains the land is getting a shower that's right running water yeah i remember a couple of years ago george the big drought mm -hmm. that we had in australia yeah and that was a, a nasty one it certainly was i remember going to that like i go with friends to a farm in new south wales a couple of times a year and i remember driving there and the earth was barren and dusty and like even like the streets were dirty. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it was dusty. It needed a good wash. I used to live in Sydney, and you still do. Isn't it nice when it's rained for a while? All the streets feel clean. It is. I know. Just driving after a while, you get all this rubbish on the roads. You know, cars, oil stains, and this and that. The buildings get dusty and dirty. The windows covered in garbage and. A good rain just cleans everything. You're driving and you think, wow, the roads are so clean, the houses look cleaner, everything's just cleaner. The air smells fresher. Yeah. You know, everything's, well, it's running water. That's the scriptures we looked at last week. It is. Cleansing. And it's, like I yeah. said, it's a shower for the earth. And it's yeah. talked about here in the Bible, how it actually happens. Mm -hmm. This is how the sun evaporates the water, forms clouds, and returns it back to the earth. Incredible. Yeah. Why don't you read the last one, George and Job? Okay, Job chapter 36, verses 27 and 28. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. There we go. So we're getting distilled water. Mm -hmm. It's purified. Yep. It's amazing. Yep. yep. Once the water hits the earth and starts running through the mountains and through the dirt and starts to dissolve minerals and so on. But when it evaporates, it leaves all that behind. That's right. So even like in survival methods to try and get water if you're somehow on a deserted island, you have to find ways of getting water. One of the best ways is to evaporate it. Put, yeah. you know, put in a plastic sheet between four rocks and sort of into a little bevel, make it drop into a cup, just drop grass underneath the plastic, let the water evaporate, and then as the water forms onto the plastic sheet, it sort of flows down to one point and drops into a cup. You've got clean water. Yeah. You, know, you can do that true. with salt water, whatever, because mm -hmm. it leaves all the minerals behind. Yeah. And you've got distilled clean water. Incredible. Thousands of years yeah. ago. It is incredible. I mean, this is scientifically accurate. No superstitions, 
no ridiculous stories or worldviews of the time, things that they would think. This is scientifically accurate. The sun evaporates yeah. the water from the earth, from the oceans, from whatever, forms the clouds, and then returns it back to earth in the form of rain. Yeah. Incredible. It is incredible. Mm -hmm. And man's still not smart enough to try and capture all that water and farm it out to areas where there's times of drought. Nice, clean water. Just goes down the drains and make out to sea. Well, uh, that's another issue, George. I mean, all the greenies, they just won't allow it. I mean, especially in Australia, like the amount of rain Sydney gets and during those drought, when the drought comes, mm. uh, it's shocking when we know how much water that we've had and it just, like you said, goes back to the oceans. Yeah. I mean, especially like some of the floods in Queensland and you know, it starts coming all the way down Australia and we mm. can't capture this water because the no, greenies, they won't let you build the dams. Yeah, and some for some reason they cower to them. Yeah, I know. Anything to stop progress, they they're happy. Not wrong. Alrighty, so anything else to add to that, George? Besides no, how I amazing it is and how incredible that is. No, I think you're pretty much covered it, Don. I mean, I was flabbergasted with all those big words you use in the relation. Actually, I've got a question in Job thirty six twenty eight mm -hmm. in this archaic English. Mm -hmm. Which the clouds do drop. What's that mean, George? Mm, which the clouds do drop. I mean, to me, I'm I'm just a simple man, Don. Well, that's why I'm asking you, because you are. Yeah, to me, I I am simple. Yeah, my wife keeps telling me that. You should go to an independent fundamental Baptist church. They're looking I for should. people like you. Yeah, I know. Easily manipulated. Uh, yeah. You got plenty of money. Me, I wish. Oh, well, you're no good to them. No, but uh, as simple as I am, Don, to me, which the clouds do drop means that the clouds do drop water. Ah, see, this archaic English is just you know getting to me. I just don't understand like the word. No, you have to you have to read it for a while, Don, and study it before you can get into the into the gist of it. I sort of understand the second word, the. Yeah, the T H. Well, what about clouds? clouds? You know, those. Sometimes they're white and fluffy. Sometimes they're oh, dark. they look like cotton balls and stuff. Yeah. 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 Now, see, I'm all right with three little words. After that, I start to struggle. Yeah. You know, I like the, the do. That's that's and. Do, that's, yeah. yeah. You know, Drop. man. Yeah. You know, but upon, now I'm starting to struggle. Abundantly, that's uh, Oof, forget uh, about yeah, it. That, that's got four syllables in it. That's mm, yeah, no, forget about that one. I don't know. Yeah, it's very, it is. It's it's a hard one, Don. It's a hard mm -hmm. one. Maybe we need a, a Greek scholar to tell us what it uh, well, in this case, a Hebrew scholar because it is the Old Testament. Well, tell us what it really means. What about a modern version? Maybe we can service, yeah, 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 yeah. See so yeah. we can see what it actually says because I don't understand any of these words. Mm, you're right. This archaic English is just uh, getting to me. Yeah, I know what you mean. But uh, anyway, we'll soldier on, I suppose. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, maybe someone's out there can help us out, can email us what all these words yeah. mean. Someone educated. Yeah, yeah, especially if you've got letters after your name. Yeah. yeah. That would work. Maybe a King James only person. King James occasionally, you mean? Occasionally. Don't yeah. call them King James only. Yeah. Because they're not. My apologies, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're King James only as pretenders. I suppose you could say that. Yeah. But uh, All right, George, what's the next one? Well, the next one, Don, is on circumcision. Okay, and why, why it's done on the eighth day. Not why it's done at all. That's a covenant between God and, and the Jews at the time. But... God picked the eighth day to do it. Why did he do that? Have you heard of a chemical clotting compound called prothrombin? Um, yeah, yeah. I hear that every second yeah, day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's part of my vocabulary. Well, anyway, Don, we all have this uh, clotting chemical in our body called prothrombin. It's a difficult word to say. And the prothrombin... Proth 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 Prothrombin. Proth prothrombin. Uh. Prothrombin. It depends where you accentuate it. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, it peaks in a newborn on the eighth day. And in, the, and in a human's life, that day is the day where it's at its peak in our bodies. 
Now, God told the Jews in the Old Testament that they had to circumcise the male child on the eighth day. Why? Because God knew that on that day, the prothrombin was at its peak. And since they were cutting off the foreskin of the little guy, um, you'd, you want the blood to clot so that the kid won't bleed to death. True? Mm-hmm. All right. So basically, the eighth day was the safest day to circumcise a baby. Now, how did Moses know that? Well, basically, George, a child, like a baby, like I said, they haven't got this particular chemical. If they start to bleed mm-hmm. before this particular chemical is developed, they can basically bleed to death. That's true. Because the blood won't clot. That's There's right. also a disease called hemophilia or hemophil- yeah. they're hemophiliacs. That's true, Don. Their blood doesn't clot, and uh, if they start bleeding, if they incur an injury, they can actually bleed to death if they're not careful. That's right, unless you know, they have to quickly cover it up or just get it yeah. stitched uh, yeah. because it doesn't clot. For a baby, it has to be done on, that's on the eighth day is when they start to get this chemical. That's right. And how did Moses know that? Because God told him to do it on the eighth day. Moses didn't know why he had to do it on the eighth day, but God did. So let's have a look at some scriptures, Don. Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So God tells them there, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised. Yep. In Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Once again, God again says eighth day. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 59, And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. So again, this was a covenant God had with the Jews, and the Little baby boys had to be circumcised on the eighth day because on the eighth day, God knew that that clotting chemical prothrombin peaks in that day. So did the Jews start getting circumcised after that, when the first mention of it, on the eighth day in Genesis seventeen twelve. 12? Uh, I'm pretty sure they did. Um, and that was Abraham. Okay, but Moses obviously wrote the book of Genesis. Yes. Yeah, so he was the one that's saying it. Okay. But one of the read a rebuttal on and saying, well, they could have easily have, you know, through trial and error, they worked out that the eighth day is the best day because if they did it after a baby was born and they started circumcising it, if they did it, for example, on the second or third day, they, that would die, it would bleed to death. And so they waited four days and then it still bled to death and, until eventually, oh, look, on the eighth day, it seems to work. Couldn't they... That's one of the rebuttals that I've read, which is true. I mean, I'm not going to argue with them and say that that's not plausible. Don't you think, George? I guess it's true. They could have. So really, like they're saying, this is not one of the ones where, oh, that's, this is a supernatural statement here because through trial and error, you could have worked that out anyway. But obviously, some babies would have had to die in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> okay, look, we'll give you that one. But nevertheless, read a lot of other scriptures which are scientifically accurate. So we can throw this one in there as well. They knew what they're talking about. When we Remember, when it came to a lot of the health issues uh, about sanitation, washing your hands, I think we can throw this in that, look, this is God's knowledge and not man's knowledge. They didn't have to do it through trial and error. They didn't have to you know, kill babies to do it. They already knew on the eighth day this was the best day to do it because God told them to do it. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's the only logical explanation you could come to, Don. I mean, taking all those other scriptures that you mentioned into consideration, why wouldn't you deny this one? I'd like to be fair. What they say, you know, the rebuttal, and I'm not going to really argue with them about it. And I can say, yeah, I can pay that. So, yeah, they could have done that. Yeah. But what we're saying through all the other corroborating evidence that we've had, the scriptures we've looked at, especially the books of Moses where he talks about running water and uh, sanitation. Well, he knew what he was talking about. So he didn't have to do this through trial and error. Yeah. He wrote this because God told him to write it and God knows. 
Exactly. So that's what we've got to say about that. Yeah. But that's incredible. That's that's fantastic, isn't it? It is. Well, let's do one more, George, and I think we can call it a night. What do you reckon? Yeah, it sounds good, Don. I think we've bagged enough people for one night. Then again, we might think of some others. There's always time to bag people. Right? Yeah. You know that. Look, I might read the scripture first, George, and then okay. we'll discuss it. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Now, science has recently discovered, again, it's a, it's a recent discovery, that we have just the right amount of water compared to land on Earth to sustain life as we know it. Uh If there was significantly more or less water, we wouldn't, the Earth would not support life as we know it. Uh And like it's roughly, it's two-thirds water, one-third land, isn't it, George? Yeah, something like that. It's approximate. It's around, it's, you know, 60 to 70% of water and 30% land. How did Isaiah know that? Yeah. How did he know the, the ratio of water to land 3,000 years or so ago? But God knew it. And God says it there, and now science has discovered that this is true. Again, mm. as we've mentioned last week, if science corroborates God's word, well, it's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, they hate to do it. I'm sure they must cringe when they find these discoveries, and then someone says, oh, that's written in the Bible. What, 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 what? You serious? Yeah. And somehow they're going to try and cover it up. But the ratio of land to water is how we survive and how we have life on Earth. It must have something to do with the amount of rain and so on. Yeah. Like, like we read earlier, the precipitation, we need roughly that sort of ratio. If there was, say, 50-50, it might not work as well or might not work at all. Don't know. Mm. But as far as science is concerned, they're saying the ratio is spot on. Yeah, so science is caught up again with the Word of God. Yep, yep. Again, scientifically accurate. And as I mentioned last, no other holy books talk this way or mention any of this sort of stuff. Anything when it comes to scientific observations of, uh, like I said, land and space and stars, the Bible is accurate every single time. And it's incredible. You'd think, Don, that eventually all these scientists that believe in evolution, after they've seen all these scientific facts in the Bible, realise that the Bible is true, would just throw their hands up in the air and say, you know what, evolution must be a load of garbage too. Let's just believe the creation account as it's written in the Word of God. But their pride won't let them. Well, they do the opposite, George. Yeah. The more they discover the more complex they discover, like when they discover the genome, like, the, you know, they classified all the genes. Mm-hmm. Instead of turning around, when they, you know, when they saw how complex it was, uh, instead of turning around and said, oh, look, guys, there, there's definitely a designer, there is definitely a creator. They said, oh, this definitely proves evolution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the opposite. They're saying, you know, because now we, look, all the genes, we, it's all similar, we're all similar and so on. Yeah. Instead of, like I said, they go the opposite. Yeah. You know, when they found, they started finding all the fossils in the earth, instead of saying, you know, oh, yeah, Manoa's flood must have happened because there's fossils all over the earth. Mm. Like, you know, some, some catastrophic happening happened. Mm. No, no, it couldn't, couldn't, have, couldn't have been a worldwide flood. It was uh, an asteroid. Yeah. I remember what we were saying last week, the asteroid gap theory. Yeah. An asteroid smashed into the earth and all these fish fossils, fish blew out the top of Mount Everest and landed right there. What makes me really angry, George, is like, especially now they're, they're doing a lot of research and they've got a lot of probes on Mars. Mm-hmm. And they've, they're always talking about how Mars once had water on it and they've got evidence that there were rivers because they've got canyons and they've got like little creek beds and so on. And they talk about that Mars was once flooded. All of Mars was once flooded. There's not a skerrick of water on there at the moment. Mm. But that had a worldwide flood or Mars-wide flood, mm. I suppose. It would probably be a better way of saying it. But the Earth, which is 75% water, <laughs> no, that, <laughs> never, that never had a worldwide flood. 
No, that's a very good point, Don. But Mars hasn't got one drop of them. <laughs> yet. They had a well, that had a Mars-wide flood. I mean, you just want to scream. I know. It's like they do the exact opposite of what is actually true. They've got no excuse. Like, as technology increases, as, it, as we found the electron microscope and stronger microscopes and stronger telescopes, instead of bringing them closer to God to, to show them, look how complex everything is. I mean, mm. Darwin didn't know anything about cells or uh, the complexity of a cell and, and all the different you know, genomes and, you know, genes and chromosomes and amino acids. and He didn't know any of that. No. They do now. Yeah. And instead of saying, guys, look, we give up. <laughs> There's a creator. No. Yeah. No, this, proves, no. this proves evolution. How no. does it prove... <laughs> How does it prove evolution? The more no, complex bizarre. it gets, you know, it's yeah, it drives you crazy. It's just bizarre, Don. What can you say? Not much. Just shake your head as usual. Yeah. And sort of, like I say, George, I keep thinking maybe it's us. Maybe it's us and not them. You know, maybe we shouldn't believe what we say and what verses say, and we shouldn't believe what we see and what we know, what our life experience tells us. What we like, we should ignore all that and just believe them. Because they say so. Yeah. Just ignore your senses. Ig- ignore your common sense. You know, life comes from life, that sort of thing. Ignore all that. Just because things look created doesn't mean they are. Mm. Like the old say, yes, last week, what you said, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, well, it's not a duck. <laughs> Maybe we have to start thinking like that. You know, yeah. we've got to be part of the loop, George. Yeah. Maybe. I feel isolated. Oh, well, I'm sure there's others like us out there, Don. I haven't met them yet. Well, like I said, there's not many King James Bible believing believers, that's for sure. No, there isn't. But they're out there. Oh, of course they're out there. Which was one of the prophets, uh, was it uh, God? He said that he thought he was special, and God says, I don't need you, I've got 10,000 just like you. Yeah. God says I could raise these stones up. Yeah, yeah. Not no. like we're saying we we feel special because I'm no. sure there there's definitely. No, no. We're just being facetious, but we know they're out there. But you know, we haven't come across. Not in our circles. I mean, besides, no. It's like you say, George. Besides, you know, our immediate family, my mother, our wives. Yeah. I don't know. If, if, every time I run into King James believer, after five minutes of talking to him. They're strangling me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Steam coming out of their ears, yeah. telling me how great modern versions are. <laughs> yeah. Hey, slow down. I thought you were a King James earliest. Well, Don, look, I'm sure there are people out there just like us, and I basically what I believe is they've gone to these King James only churches, they believe exactly what we believe, and they just got sick of it and just said, you know what, I'm not going anymore, I've had enough. And they're just living their own life and probably preaching the gospel in their own circles and trying to teach people the right way. And, and that's it. Mm, sure. They're out there. True. Well, George, I think, uh, yep, the music's gone. Oh, that music again, eh? Well, at least we know when it's time for us to uh, call it quits. Fair enough, Tom. Mm, so, I think we're about halfway through this, so it's good. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much halfway through. Got a bit to go. Yeah. What are we going to do after this? I think we've got to do... Maybe we'll look at prophecy or something like that. Yeah, why not? All right. All right, mate. Look, uh, have a good night. As usual, give my regards to the wife. You too, Don. Take it easy. And we'll talk again soon. And hang on, everyone, for Alexander Scoopy and his wonderful rendition of the gospel. Amen. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen.